Well, back in June, Sharon Osbourne told her fellow Talk TV panellists that her husband, rock legend Ozzy, needed major surgery, and it was an operation which would determine the rest of his life, and she hasn't left his side since. But over the weekend, Ozzy was spotted for the first time at Living Hospital out and about with Sharon and the kids in L.A. And I'd like to say Sharon joins me now live. Sharon, good evening to you. Good evening, my darling. Now, I've spent the last 20 minutes boasting about the fact it was going to be you and Ozzy, and he's done a runner. He's a bastard tonight, <laughs> let me tell you. Now he's, now he's back walking, he's a diva. <laughs> Before it was like, oh, you know, the nicest guy, you know, please help me do this, do that. Now he's walking, he's like, oh, I don't want to do it, I'm not doing this, I'll do this. So he's become a diva again. Well, he thinks quite... he's bloody Beyonce. <laughs> well, I quite like the fact he's a diva again, because it means he's healthy again, at least. And he's been, let's be honest, Oz I know, Ozzy's I been know. through... A hell of a series of health battles, hasn't he? he? He diagnosed with a form of Parkinson's. He had a rough bout of COVID. And then he had this surgery on his, I think, on his neck, right? It's all, and does this all it go back, his... Sharon? Does it all go back to when he had the, the, the terrible quad bike accident? A part of it, yes. Yes, part of it. Because then he had another serious fall on his neck and then it um, affected his spine because the spinal column was trapped. Mm. So it's, it's just been, it's like a domino effect. You do one thing medically, then another thing happens and another, and it's just been nearly, it's three and a half years of just nightmare. But you know what, there's light now and he's walking great, he's mm. got no more pain. He's a pain in my ass because he's now a diva, <laughs> but I don't mind. <laughs> but he's good. And, is he, um, how he's, is he feeling? Other than being a good. diva, how is he feeling? He's doing good because there's no pain. The last mm. operation fixed all the pain that he'd been in for, you know, three and a half years. So that way, you know, it's, it's like lifting, you know, a huge weight from him. So, you know, he's busy doing promotion for his record that's coming out in mm. September and he's, he's loving life right now. Is he going to be able to, to perform live tour again, do you think? Yes, next year, definitely. Well, that's, I mean, that's amazing. Yes. Given, you... given where he was, he must be thrilled, huh? Oh, it's, it's like a miracle, Piers. And he's like, you know, his song, Iron Man. He really is Iron mm. Man. I mean, he comes back over and over again. Yeah. <laughs> He does. He's unbelievable. I mean, I know, that it, yeah. I know it's been really rough for you because we've had a few, you know, quite intense conversations in the last couple of years about Aussie's various health things. You're unbelievably close to each other. You were on the other side of the world a couple of times when he was, you know, taken with COVID and then he had to have the surgery and stuff. It's been, it's been rough for you, Sharon. How have you dealt with it all? Oh, it's, you know, it's not just me, it's the whole family because, you know, you're, you're always on edge like this. You know, every cough, every, you know, every time he would stumble trying to walk, I mean, you're just on edge. But it's, you know, it's just behind us. And now all we can do is just, you know, hope and look into the light and everything's going to be fine. And listen, 10 days ago, Jack had his baby girl. Mm. Yes. And so that's brought such joy, and Kelly's pregnant. It's, so it's fantastic. Be the Osborne breeding factory is alive and well. It is. <laughs> it is. We're back in business. <laughs> <laughs> are, they, are they basically breeding the next generation of wild rock chicks and blokes? I hope so. <laughs> But, uh, <laughs> well, look, please, send, uh, Sharon, send them all my very best, won't you? Ozzy, uh, Kelly and Jack. I want to talk to you, if I can, just about a couple of things in the news. We, we miss you on the talk. I'll wait for you to be back on that. I want to talk to you about a couple of things. One, your reaction to this extraordinary story of that Diana interview that we all remember so well and the appalling fallout where it turns out Martin Bashir just basically forged documents to persuade people around Diana yes. that all sorts of stuff was going down, including Tiki, Tiki Ledbert, the boy's, the boy's nanny, having an affair with Charles, you know, having an abortion after being impregnated by his son, all complete nonsense, but all designed to get into Diana's paranoid mind so that she did the interview. What do you think of it? Yes. 
I mean, it's horrendous. You would never believe that this could have gone on with the BBC. That, you know, their credibility, their, you know, the biggest news agency in the world, everything they do is, you know, perfect, perfect. They're the perfect news station. And it's like, look at what they did to a family. Mm. Just think if they hadn't have done that, that marriage might have turned out very, very differently. Yeah. Just think about that. Yeah. Everybody's lives would have turned out so differently. And it's appalling. It's like unthinkable to think of the damage mentally, physically, that the BBC did to the royal family. And not just the royal family, people that were very loyal to them. Yes. I mean, Tiggy was unbelievably loyal. Yeah, never it, gave interviews, never talked yeah, about them. Total never, soul of discretion. Never, ever. Yeah. And the thing is, it too, the nation turned, listen, divorced, you never get involved in people's divorces, mm. ever. That's one thing I've learned. But with everything that was being reported, Charles looked such, so bad, yeah. so bad. Yeah. And the whole nation at that time were against him and it was all for, you know, about, Di about Diana. But it's, you know, I get that. But... If they hadn't have done that, maybe they could have got their marriage back together and, you know, who knows what could have happened. Yeah. The other royal thing that's been in the news is big, this big Tom Bauer book about uh, Meghan and Harry paints a pretty uh, yeah. awful picture, actually, of the pair of them. And we have this bizarre speech by Harry on Nelson Mandela Day this week, sort of linking his, their own struggle for freedom with Nelson Mandela's 27 years in, in prison. What, what do you make of these two? What, what's going on with them? I think they're lost, and I think that they're trying to find their, their place in the world. I think they're totally lost. Mm. You know, one minute they're making a cartoon, then they're doing a documentary on them, now they're saving the world. They just haven't found their path in life yet. I, I really believe that. They're lost. They're floundering. Should they be... But, Sharon, my point is, they can do what the hell they like, but should they be allowed to use the royal titles to fleece the system and make all this money and pretend to be like a rival royal family? That's what sticks in my gullet about it. Yeah, I, I just don't... I, I'm, I haven't, from day one, been into the fact of, you know, talking about private things that went on in the royal family when they were a part of it. And the thing is, it's just their point of view. We haven't had the other point of mm. view. And it's like, don't... Don't bring it to the public. Nobody wants to know about it. Every family has problems. Keep it to yourself. Yeah. Keep it to yourself. Yeah. And I just, I just think that from day one, they've handled it very badly. And you know what? They wanted their freedom. They have it. But they want more than just their freedom. They want to be two very important people politically. Yeah, but they want the royal cake and eat it. But um, I think if they keep poking their nose into American and uh, political affairs and the Constitution and so on, it's not going to end well, I can tell them that. Oh, um, I want to talk to you also about... It's Dave like he's, a, he's only... He's I was just going to say, he's only been here two minutes and he wants to run the country. It's like, hold on. <laughs> it's completely absurd. Um, talking about Dave Chappelle. So Dave Chappelle, I don't know if you've been following this, but he did this big Netflix special. He told some, some trans jokes. You know, some people thought it was funny, including trans people. Other people, including other trans people, hated it. One of them cancelled. Netflix stood by him. But he was due to play in a, a gig in Minneapolis yesterday. And they cancelled it, the organisers, at the last minute and issued this mm -hmm. ridiculous, pompous statement about how, you know, they hadn't been aware that it wouldn't be a safe space for employees and so yeah. on. Uh, what do you make of it? It comes at a time when John Cleese actually has come out with an interesting comment about the threat to comedy at the moment from this cancel culture. Here's, here's what John Cleese had to say. A lot of comedians now uh, are sitting there and when they think of something, they start thinking, oh, could I get away with that? I don't think so. So and so got into trouble when he said that or she said that. You see what I mean? And that's the death of creativity. And I, I think he's... Look, I'm not a big fan of John Cleese, uh, to be honest, these days. He's a bit of a miserable old bore and he can't stand me, but that's, uh, that's neither here nor there. Oh, I, think, I love him. I think Shush, I love him. Well, we'll agree to disagree about him. Uh, I'll probably get on fire with him, actually. If you're watching, John, come and do an interview. Um, but here's what... It's, it's sort of the statement that really made me puke. The Dave Chappelle show tonight at First Avenue has been cancelled. Uh, to staff, artists and our community, we hear you. We are sorry. 
We know we must hold no. ourselves to the highest standards. We let you down. We're not just a blank box of people in it. We understand First Avenue is not just a room, but meaningful beyond our walls. The team and you have worked hard to make our venue the safest spaces in the country, and we'll continue with that mission. We believe in diverse voices and the freedom of artistic artist expression, but in honoring that, we lost sight of the impacts would have. I mean, what a load of old guff. Right. What they really, what they, what just, they really mean is, it's just, we are going to decide what you're allowed to find funny. And that's it. It's ridiculous. It's again a case of freedom of speech. This man is a brilliant writer, a brilliant comic, and when you watch him, he just doesn't tell silly jokes one after the mm. other to try and offend. It go always goes along with a story, and there's always the beginning, middle, and end, and it always comes around to, well, what do you think about it? This is what I think, and he does it. Uh, superbly. The point is, he's not, he's Listen, not transphobic. If we, if we can't... He's not transphobic. No, but, he, no, but he thinks you should be able to tell... Not. You should be able to tell jokes about trans people, like we told jokes about everybody. And actually, they're funny as jokes. Of course. And the thing is, the thing is, if there, um, if there are many trans people that don't... that he offends, it's very, very simple. Don't watch. Yes. Turn it off. Go and watch something else. But think... there are also millions of people that love him that do want to watch him. I'm one of them. I think he's a genius. Oh, no question. But the thing is, it's like, it's simple. Why do people make such a big deal about, you know what he does, you know what he's famous for, don't watch it. Simple. I think, I think if we can't tell inappropriate jokes anymore, you and I are going to have to go and live on a desert island somewhere with Ozzy. Oh, God, we might as well live in bloody Russia. I mean, <laughs> if you can't laugh, right? It's... You've got to laugh, you know. You've got to have irony. You've, you've got to laugh. With the, work, the state of the world right now, if you can't go out or watch something at home that's funny, what are we going to do? Do you know what I read the other day? Was that there's lots of WhatsApp groups now that everybody's on where inappropriate jokes are told because it's in secret. And I thought, how incredible, what a damning indictment of our society. In a way, it is a bit like Russia or North Korea or China, where people feel they have to, they have to go is. underground to crack a joke in case yes. somebody's upset and, you, yeah. and you, you end up losing your job or your livelihood. Exactly. I mean, all the time people send me things and I'm like, where the hell did you find that? <laughs> you know, and some of them are funny, some of them aren't, but it's like, who the hell is making all this stuff? But some of it is very funny. Sharon, fantastic. And, you know, it's, it's humour. Of course it's humour. Uh, Go on. Sharon, great to talk to you. Send Ozzy my best. Tell him I'm sorry he bottled it, but as soon as, he's, as soon as he grows a pair, get on this show and be uncensored for me. He owes me one, all right? He owes you big time, and I'm going to tell him he's got to come on and do a river dance for you. Yes, he has. I look forward to seeing him <laughs> okay. uh, very soon. Sharon, great to talk to you. All I'm right. so glad the old man's... Back Love on his feet. Tears. I know how worried you've been as a family. He is indomitable. He's indestructible. And unfortunately, he he's not on he the is. show. <laughs> but we will see him <laughs> soon. Sharon, great to see you. All right. All the best. Loves you. Bye.